Hello and welcome back. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about, since we've now written cell potentials, we've noticed that all of our cell potentials and our galvanic cells and our spontaneous cells and our voltaic cells, remember those are all synonyms, have all been positive. And we can use that to our advantage. We'll figure out technically why they're all positive in just a little while. But we can use it to our advantage because we can now figure out things about what is going to oxidize, what is going to reduce, by making sure that the cell potential we get is positive. We talked a little bit about that earlier on, but we'll do some more specific examples right now. So let's say we had a battery, and in our battery, remember we're going to draw it, and the general thing is to draw the anode on the left and the cathode on the right, but I don't know which one's which yet, so I'm just going to draw these guys here. And I'm going to put nickel on this side, and I'm going to put, let's see, manganese on that side. And what I'm trying to figure out is which side is going to oxidize and which side is going to reduce. So I'm going to put nickel 2 plus in here and Mn 2 plus in here. And so I've got two possible things. I could have nickel being oxidized to nickel 2 plus, or I could have nickel 2 plus being reduced to nickel. So what we're going to do is we're going to look in the table of standard reduction potentials. Remember, no matter what, we always look up reduction potentials. And that's going to be for nickel 2 plus, plus 2 electrons goes to nickel solid. And if you look that up, it is a minus 0.23 volts, which means it's less likely to be reduced than the standard hydrogen electrode. We look it up for manganese plus 2 electrons, I'm sorry, manganese 2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to manganese solid. The standard cell potential for that is a minus 1.18 volts. And so we know now a little bit, like talked about, how these are standard reduction potentials. So point, negative 0.23 is actually a larger number than negative 1.18, right? We'd rather owe someone 0.23 dollars than we'd owe them the dollar 18. And so that one has a slightly less negative reduction potential, so it is less likely to be reduced, which means chances are the manganese is going to be Sorry, I said it backwards. I realized as I was talking, right? Lots of language in here. So let me start that over. Nickel has a larger reduction potential, which means it's more likely to be reduced. Manganese has a smaller reduction potential, which means it's less likely to be reduced. But we can figure that out by trying to calculate the cell potential in the two different ways. We can either calculate minus 0.23 volts, minus minus 1.2. 1, 8 volts, or we can calculate E cell is minus 1.18 volts minus minus 0.23 volts. You see how all these minus signs get a little confusing if you're not really keeping very good track of them. Right? Our minuses are all going to cancel here, so I'm going to put my pluses there since my minuses cancel. So I've got minus 0.23 plus 0.18, that is going to be greater than 0. I've got minus 1.8 plus 0.23, that's going to be less than 0. And we know that it can't be this second one. We know that our cell must be like this, because we've said that cell potentials are always positive. And again, we'll kind of show that later as to why that's true. But what does that mean? If this is cathode minus anode, we know that the 1.23 volts is our cathode. That's where reduction is taking place, and that's where oxidation is taking place. And so we did end up drawing this one backwards, but that's OK. It's why the drawing rules aren't so um, fixed. It's because sometimes you draw it, and then you figure it out. Whereas when you're doing a line notation, you've usually already figured things out when you, by the time you draw your line notation. So we know that nickel is being reduced, manganese is being oxidized. And so if we were to actually write what was going on, nickel is being reduced. So it's going from nickel 2 plus to nickel solid. And manganese is doing the opposite. Manganese solid goes to manganese 2 plus. And it looks something like that. Now it turns out this reaction is also already balanced because we have our charges balanced and our masses balanced. So we're good there. And that's actually 
the cell that we're talking about. And if you were to calculate that, uh, we never, never actually wrote that out, it is a plus 0.95 volts. So you get about one volt out of this cell. And again, what that means is if you actually hook up nickel and manganese and put a voltmeter across them, it would measure about 0.95 volts. If everything was at standard conditions. What's standard conditions? One molar concentrations, one atmosphere of any pressures, and 25 degrees Celsius. So like I said, tables of these things. The thing on top, most likely to be reduced. The thing on bottom, least likely to be reduced. So we can always compare two things. We compare 0.15 and minus 0.4. This one's gonna be reduced. This one's gonna be oxidized. If we compare uh, minus 0.14 to minus 0.5, this one's gonna be reduced. This one's gonna be oxidized. The thing higher up on the table with a larger reduction potential is going to be reduced. Okay. One last one, we compare these two. The top one's going to be reduced, the bottom one's going to be oxidized. Okay, So <clears throat> you can always figure that out just by looking at a table, who's going to be reduced and who's going to be oxidized, and then when you calculate it, you should always get a positive cell potential. So why is a positive E cell spontaneous? What drives that? Well, if you remember from our last chapter on thermodynamics, there's only one thing, one criteria, one, one, two, one, one, one criteria for what makes something spontaneous. You remember? Yeah. The entropy of the universe has to increase. Yeah, I know. It's always hard to talk about the universe. Okay. What do we ask? What else did we figure out? We figured out that delta G has to be less than zero. That's a little easier, right? That delta G, this thing we can calculate by looking up numbers in a table, is less than zero. That shows that it's spontaneous because we related that to the entropy of the universe. So let's look at E cell and talk about whether we can relate E cell to delta G. If you remember, early on in the conversation, we had this random page of numbers and equations. And one of them we said, hey, look, if you take charge times voltage, you get energy. Why? Because voltage is joules per coulomb, charge is coulombs. They cancel out and you get joules. Okay. In fact, let me just write that out. Coulombs times joules per coulomb, ding, you get joules. And so you get an energy by multiplying charge and voltage. We also said that the charge was the number of moles of electrons times Faraday's constant times the voltage. So that's a different way of doing it. And it turns out that for convention reasons, we need to put a negative there. Why? Because we are saying that when we give off energy is when um, things are positive voltages. It's just part of the definition of the voltage. And so we do have to put a negative there in front of that NF. I just added it there in case you didn't notice. We have to put a negative in front of there just to meet our conventions. Well, sorry, this is not E cell. This is just energy. Sorry. This is just energy. So energy is charged by voltage. Energy is minus NF times voltage. Right? But what's the voltage? That's our cell potential. So we get energy is equal to minus NF times E cell. That's why I had to fix it, because I'm like, wait, I put E cell in the wrong spot. Easy to do, right? Easy to do these kind of mistakes. I leave them in on my videos so that you understand that even people who do this for a living make mistakes. All right, so, well, turns out that's just delta G. That's the available energy to do work from a cell. That was kind of our definition of delta G. Delta G said, hey, we can do stuff with this energy. We can do stuff with this work. And so that is my delta G. I'm not going to you know, prove that to you. I'm just going to tell it to you. And you, hopefully it makes sense that, that that is our energy that is available. Now, what does that mean? It means if E cell is positive, Faraday's is just a constant. It's positive. 
n is just the number of electrons transferred. It's positive. We put a negative in front of there. Then delta g is less than 0. Right? So whenever we have a positive E cell, we have a negative delta G. And we know from our previous work that a negative delta G means it's spontaneous. And so that's why we end up with the positive cell potentials, is because we end up with a negative delta G. All right, cool. Remember n here, in case you're wondering, number of moles of electrons transferred. How do we know that? We know that by balancing our redox reaction. And I'm just going to show you an example here, or part of an example. Let's say we had 10 electrons plus blah, 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 goes to blah, blah, blah. And that was our, um, our reduction step. And our oxidation step was da -da, da -da, plus um, 5 electrons. We'd end up multiplying this guy by 2 so that this becomes a 10. That 10 electrons, when you've balanced the reaction out, when you've balanced everything out, that is the number of moles of electrons. Not in the reduction step or in the oxidation step, but after you've multiplied them all together and found that number that makes sure that they cancel out on both sides. That's the number of moles of electrons that you're going to stick into the equation that delta G is equal to minus N F E cell. That's where your n comes from. And so it's just going to be, you know, in this case, it would be 10. You're literally just going to write 10 moles there as your n. Let's do an example. And uh, let's do an example with copper and iron. Now, an example with copper and iron is going to look like this. We've got Cu2 plus aqueous plus solid iron goes to Cu solid and iron 2 plus. Okay, So we're just trading electrons out. Who's being oxidized in this case? Hopefully you came up with iron. right? Why? Because he's losing electrons going from 0 to plus 2. That's an oxidation step. All right, we look up cell potential, Cu2 plus plus 2e minus goes to Cu solid is E naught equals 0 0.34 volts. We look up Fe2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to Fe solid. And that's E naught equals minus 0 0.44 volts. And now we're getting a hang of this thing. So we can look at that and be like, who's going to get oxidized? Who's going to get reduced? And we look at the standard reduction potential. The larger standard reduction potential is copper. And so copper is going to be reduced. Ions can be oxidized, which is what we saw in our balanced reaction. right? We're just kind of confirming that it makes sense in this case. My E cell is just going to be 0 0.34 minus a minus 0 0.44 volts. And that's going to be a positive 0 0.78 volts. If we wanted to calculate delta G, it's going to be minus N F times E cell. N in this case, well, if you look, this is, ends up being a balanced reaction. We don't have to do anything to it. We don't have to do all our little steps because we've got charge balance and we've got mass balance, so we're OK. But in each one of these, two electrons is transferred. And so this is going to be minus 2 moles. Then we do Faraday's constant, which is 96,485 coulombs per mole. Ding, moles cancel. And we multiply by our E cell, which is 0 0.78 volts. And remember, a volt is a joule per coulomb. And so our coulombs cancel. And when you multiply all that out, you get minus 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules, or minus 150 kilojoules. And that's the amount of energy we have available in our cell in order to run this reaction. We have about 150 kilojoules every time a mole of stuff runs, a mole of reaction. Now, I put it in kilojoules at the end just because delta G is generally reported in kilojoules. 
that's why we did that. All right. Any questions? No, 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 you don't have any questions. Oh, you do? Okay, tell me. Anyway, I'm being silly. All right, that's what we got. We can calculate delta G. We use the N from our balanced reaction. Remember, we have to do all of those balancing steps, especially for ones that involve oxygen and hydrogen and all those other things. We have to get that balancing part done to know what to put in for N. So here we go. We've got a beaker with copper and tin connected by platinum electrodes, wire and salt bridge. Notice we've got, uh, whoops, there is a mistake there. So this should be Cu, be Cu solid, okay? So Cu2 is Cu solid and tin connected by a platinum electrode wire and salt bridge. And what's going to happen? Like who's going to get oxidized? Who's going to get reduced? And what's going to be my cell potential? Go. OK. Higher reduction potential. Higher reduction potential means a higher potential will be reduced, which means that guy's going to be reduced. This one's going to be oxidized. So we know that copper is going to be reduced. So again, I have to say copper will reduce, tin will oxidize, and my cell potential is going to be 0 0.34 minus a minus 0 0.14 is equal to 0 0.48 volts. Okay, so copper is reduced, tin is oxidized, and my cell potential is 0.48 volts. Sorry for those little plus signs there as opposed to the neutral copper. I'm not sure what happened. All right, what can we do with that work? Like, is, it, is, it, is that amount of work useful? Can we do anything? Well, if you've ever made a potato gun, you know that you can compress air and basically <laughs> blow potatoes out and they go whoosh. Okay, if you have it, you can look it up because right, we live in the age of the internet, you can look up anything. And so you can see people making their potato guns and doing all sorts of things. So let's make a potato gun out of an electrochemical cell. Now, there's a little bit of disconnect there because we need pressure and not energy, but let's use the energy inside the electrochemical cell to somehow launch a potato and see how much we get. And by the way, you're never gonna have to do a calculation like this ever in my class. This is more just interesting. Like, how much energy is in a galvanic cell? Is it a lot of energy or is it very little energy? So, if you go back to your physics class, you remember that work is defined as a force moved over a distance. Now, force, if we're going to launch a potato straight up in the air, is just gravity. So it's mass times um, the uh, speed of gravity. And the distance we're going is the height. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a 0.5 kilogram potato. That's a great one. That's one of those nice, big, chunky baking potatoes that you find at the store. Not those little tiny ones you find in the, belt, in the bags, but those big, chunky ones. We're going to take a half kilogram potato, about a one pound potato. And we're going to say, hey, let's use, <coughs> excuse me, um, one mole of iron. Okay, so we're going to use one mole of iron, which is 55 grams of iron, okay? And what did we figure out? We figured out in the previous slide, two slides ago actually, let me go back over there, that when we run this reaction between iron and copper, we're gonna get 150 kilojoules per mole. Now, remember that's 150 kilojoules for the reaction as written, which means for one mole of iron. So we're gonna get 150 kilojoules if we use 55 grams of iron, because 55 grams of iron, if you look on the periodic table, is one mole of iron. So we're going to get 150 kilojoules of usable energy out of that thing. Okay. So if we had 150 kilojoules of usable energy out of that thing, what does that mean? Well, again, that's 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules. And that's about the energy or the work that I get out of it. And so I'm going to put this over here. And so what do we get? We get a kilogram, which is zero. I'm sorry, we got our potato, which is 0.5 kilograms. We get the speed, acceleration of gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared. 
and we uh, multiply by our height, which is what we are looking for. Now, these units might look a little funny to you if you're not familiar with what the fundamental unit of the joule is. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared, and so our units do end up working out. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this into my handy dandy calculator here. So I've got 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules divided by 0.5 divided by 9.81. Whoa. Whoa, height 30,581 meters. Whoa. I can launch a potato 31 kilometers into the air using a mole of iron. Right. Now, in a mole of iron, 55 grams of iron, that, that's a chunk. You know, you, you'd feel that in your hand. Let's take that down by a factor of two, right? Let's take that down by a factor of two. So instead of uh, 55 grams of iron, we need a 0.55 grams of iron. 0.5 grams of iron. I mean, you're talking less than a gram. That's that's you know half an M and M or less than half an M and M in terms of size. And iron metal's pretty dense, so maybe a quarter of M and M in size. So a little tiny bit of iron. What is that going to do? That's going to do 30, 310 meters. Okay, so this little tiny chunk of iron inside a battery can launch a potato 310 meters into the air. And yes, we're ignoring air resistance and all these other things. Come on, this is just an example. But that's amazing. That's a lot of energy in a very small amount of material, which is why batteries are so cool and they can do so many things because there's a lot of energy density inside a battery. Right? Half a gram of stuff can launch a potato. A one pound potato, not a little potato. We're not talking a ping pong ball, we're talking a potato. 310 meters in the air with a whole mole of stuff. You're talking 31 kilometers. I mean, you're, you're talking launch a potato in space. Now, obviously there's some problems there because you can't actually do that. But it's still neat, right? All right, I tried. Okay, let's do another example that's a little less exciting than a potato. We're gonna make a cell from nitric acid and copper. Now, if you followed along in this class so far, we've said every time we see nitrate, let's just ignore it because nitrate never does anything. And that's mostly true. But one thing nitrate can do is undergo some sort of electrochemical reaction. So if we have a cell from nitric acid, you can see the uh, half cell there, nitrate can react in an acidic solution to form nitrogen monoxide gas and water. And then we've got copper going from copper one to solid copper. Remember, you do have to pay attention to charges because you're going to find in your reduction potential table that there's copper two going to copper solid. There's copper one going to copper solid. And there's also a potential for copper one going to copper two. And so you've really got to pay attention to all those things and figure out. Okay, so what's going to be oxidized, what's going to be reduced, and what is the cell potential for a cell made from these guys? And we're using our little circle there, which means everything's at standard conditions, so we don't have to worry about pressure, temperature, all that kind of stuff. What do we know? The thing with a larger reduction potential is going to be reduced. You're right. All right, so we know this is going to be reduced. This is going to be oxidized. Our cell potential is just going to be 0 0.96 minus 0 0.52, which is going to be um, 0 0.44. Our delta G is going to be minus NF E cell. Now, what's going to be N in this case? Well, the nice thing, if you haven't noticed already, that in the back of the book, when you're looking at these standard reduction potentials, they do all the half reaction balancing for you. Ha ha ha! Wow, that's pretty cool. And so they've already figured out that this takes three electrons, and they've already figured out that this takes one electron. <coughs> so all you have to do is figure out from those balanced half reactions there, what's going to be the minimum number of electrons. In this case, it's going to be three electrons, because we're going to multiply that second one by three to match the three in the first one. And so we're going to say negative three moles times Faraday's constant, 96,485 joules per mole, and then our voltage, which is 0 0.44 volts. And in the last slide, you saw me write that as 0 0.44 joules per coulomb. And I just wanted to show you that all the units do cancel out to get you the thing you want. You don't have to do that when you're writing them out. You can just leave it as volts. And we understand that, of course, our units are going to work out. And if you do that, you're going to get minus 1.2 seven times 10 to the fifth joules, and that is minus 127 
kilojoules for the reaction as written. Now, what does that mean as written? Since we end up multiplying this guy by three, what that means is if you take one mole of NO, you're gonna react and get 127 kilojoules of energy. But here in the balanced reaction, its coefficient is three. So it means you actually have to take three moles of copper in order to get that 127 kilojoules. To put that in a different way, right? If, if you go back to NO3 and you're like, that one makes sense. NO3, one mole gets me 127 kilojoules because that's how it's written. But as you use up that NO3, as you use up that one mole of NO3, how much copper did you use up? Well, the stoichiometry says I used three times as much copper. So in using up that one mole of NO3, you used up three moles of copper and you got 127 kilojoules. So that hopefully make a little more sense. So it's always kilojoules for the reaction as written. So in this case, it would be three moles of copper or one mole of nitrate or four moles of hydrogen, right? Because that's the stoichiometry there. All right, you're gonna find out delta G for this cell next. We've got silver and lead. We've got the drawing down here. We've seen this drawing before. It's not a new drawing. And we're going to find the standard cell. I'm sorry, the standard Gibbs free energy of this galvanic cell. And you're going to go. All right. What are we going to do? We're going to find E cell first. We did that on another one. E cell is going to be 0 0.91 volts minus. 0 0.0 minus minus, got to get those minuses in there, minus minus 0 0.13 volts, and that's going to be a positive 1.04 volts. Delta G is going to be minus NF times 1.04 volts. What's going to be N in this case? I've got a 2 here and a 1 here. That's going to end up being a 2, right? That's when we balance that, two moles times 96,485 joules per mole, coulombs per mole, sorry, times 1.04 volts. If you multiply all that out, you get a minus 200.7 kilojoules per mole. And quite honestly, I didn't do a great job on my sig figs here. I did only have three sig figs in my cell potential, so technically I should only have three sig figs in my answer. All right, that's how we calculate our standard Gibbs free energy from cell potentials. But all of this is with that little circle there. And what's that circle? Standard conditions. How useful is it? How likely is it that what you have in front of you is a battery with one mole of this, one mole of that, one atmosphere of pressure at 25 degrees Celsius? What are we going to do when that changes? And that's what we've got coming up. Thanks so much for listening and have a wonderful day.